Well, looking at the way people voted this past Monday, it's clear Toronto is not a unified city. And so joining us now to take us through the divide is Murtaza Hader. He's a professor at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. Welcome back to the agenda. Thank you. Okay, we're going to talk about um, how this city is divided, and I want to start by bringing up a couple of maps uh, of our city. So the first one we're going to bring up is how people voted. So you see the areas in red there? That's where uh, people tended to vote uh, with a wider uh, margin, the dark red especially for uh, Doug Ford. The green areas for John Tory, and those sort of lilac, lilac purple areas uh, down by numbers 18 and 14 were for Olivia Chow. Um, the darker the areas, that means the the bigger the margin of victory. Here's the second map I want to take a look at, and this is the map of our city's immigration population, the dark red, ridings with the most uh, immigrants, some of those, as much as 80% of their population made up of immigrants. The final map is of individual income. The blue areas, and the darker they are, the highest income, and the red areas with the lowest incomes. Okay, Murtaza, these three maps, if you looked at them actually side by side, they actually tend to look quite uh, similar. What can you infer from the information on those maps? What we see from these maps is that the high-income neighborhoods or wards of the city have elected Mr. John Tory as their mayor, and the low-income neighborhoods have voted for Mr. Ford. And the income polarization, the income inequality that we saw in Toronto and people like David Hilchansky have been warning us about these have now manifested in, into political choices and political outcomes. It's, a, it's not a comfortable thing for the city to have and it's something that should have been a focus. Okay, why not? Why is it you say it's uncomfortable? Why? Well, see, the thing is, um, in this political campaign, for the, it's a very long campaign um, that, uh, for the mayoral uh, elections, and we exclusively, almost exclusively focused on public transit or transportation, uh, thinking that perhaps that was the key issue. And knowing well, the media and the candidates um, um, ignored the fact that th there is tremendous uh, income inequality now in the city. And it's not just income inequality that is random. You see these three maps and you see spatial clustering of poverty or spatial clustering of um, uh, low-income neighborhoods. And I don't want to use the word ghettos, but when you see these things forming, you have to be concerned. Mm. And unless we do things systematically to fix this problem, we would have a large problem at our hand. It's already there, but it will get worse if we don't address these issues now. Okay. Um I just want to get into how people have voted. I mean, you you say that the low income pe people, the low income areas, voted a certain way. How much do these demographics tell us about the further divide in the city beyond economics? It is not just income now, for and it's not just immigrants. If you look at the the way these uh, neighborhoods are clustered, you will notice that neighborhoods that have uh, voted for. Uh, Mr. Ford, they had two times the visible minorities than the neighborhoods that voted for Mr. Tory. If you look at the neighborhoods um, from an immigration point of view, that's not an issue, but, but it becomes a real issue when you look at the neighborhoods which, from a visible minority perspective. If you look at the household structure perspective, neighborhoods that have voted for Mr. Tory had a much larger concentration of single-person households, you know, young and hip kind of households, and those who voted for Mr. Ford had a much larger concentration of families. So these are systematic differences that we see. And then on top of it, we see that the neighborhoods out in the, up in the urban periphery, the Scarborough and the Etobicoke neighborhoods, where all these uh, factors then combine, um, that is low income and immigrants and visible minorities, again they voted for Mr. Ford and not for Mr. Tory. So what we see now, in, if you want to summarize it, you could see that the, the well-off, the wealthy of the Toronto have voted and got a mayor, and those who were uh, marginalized, um, their political choices were not victorious. Mm. And that is something that the new mayor has to work Towards. Okay, we'll talk about uh, more what the new mayor, John Tory, needs to do about all this. But I want to pick up on something that you said, which was that the areas with the higher levels of immigration tended to vote for Doug Ford. And this is where I need your help sort of trying to understand this. Because the Fords, particularly um, Rob Ford, um, have been accused of making racist comments, uh, broadly, more broadly of racism many times. So given that, it would seem... It surprises me that people, especially visible minority immigrants, would be voting for the Fords. Explain this to me. Okay, so I have a take on this. I think what has happened is, given that we know that Mr. Ford is more popular in neighborhoods which are predominantly family neighborhoods and low-income neighborhoods, they rely a great deal on private automobile, the car 
for their mobility. If they have a job, even if it's not well paying, they still need their car to get to their jobs because there is no public transit either at the place they, where they start their trip or the place where they end their trip. So when these households listen to Mr. Tory or Ms. Chow, who are very transit focused and almost nothing to offer on the car side, they get a little concerned because they see that their welfare will be seriously affected by the fact that no one is talking about cars and they are actually saying, let's find ways to curb car car-based mobility. That's where the Fords come in and they say car, 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 and they listen because mm. their mobility is tied to, they're not just mobility, but their welfare, the low-income households out in the suburbs where transit is not a viable option. Their welfare is tied to cars and that's why they um, associate or see themselves more in line with the Fords than they would with Chow, Ms. Chow and Mr. Mr. Tory. Okay, so in other words, the car was more of a priority for them than whether or not someone may be making racist remarks. In the yeah, program. they can easily They could dismiss, dismiss that, saying, that. because you're, you're my guy because you, you talk about cars. Exactly. If you look at the neighborhoods that have voted for Mr. Tory, you see that a large number of those neighborhoods were predominantly um, uh, single fa family or single person households, right? So single person households do not, you know, you're living alone or, with, or if you're a couple, you don't rely on car as much as if you are a family with children. And that's where the, the divide took place because people with families knew that they needed their cars and they put that at the forefront, ignoring the, 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 the off-color remarks that the mayors have, mayor or his brother had made in the past. Okay, I want to focus on, on, on the immigrant population um, some more. Is there, break, break the, down the immigrant vote, I mean, is there a difference in how the immigrant population voted depended on how successful they are economically? Yes, I think, um, so, so if you look at it from that perspective, the immigrants have not necessarily voted on the uh, ethnic or racial lines. They have voted on the economic line. If they are well-to-do immigrants, they voted like the general public. If they were struggling immigrants, they then voted with other communities who are not immigrants but struggling. So this vote was more on the economic or, or income uh, boundaries or lines rather than immigrant or non-immigrant. And so uh, the assumption would be that uh, more established immigrants, people that have been here for, for longer, are more successful economically because they've had time to, to, to build a life in Canada, whereas more recent arrivals, mm -hmm most likely more uh, in the lower uh, income bracket, tended to vote differently. That's where you see the split. Absolutely. Because, see, once you have made it, regardless of you being an immigrant or otherwise, it appears that they have all joined and voted for Mr. Tory. But those who are struggling, irrespective of their status as an immigrant or otherwise, those neighborhoods have voted for Mr. Ford. Okay. You established that the Fords draw well uh, where people use cars. What is it, then, that draws people with low income towards the Fords? Because Again, making an assumption, a lot of people low income might not be able to afford a car. That is, may not be a, necessarily a correct assumption because car-based mobility is not that expensive. Um, the problem is that low-income households are forced to live in places where there is no viable, efficient public transit. So transit as an option is not there. And if you look at Mr. Tory's support, it is right around the young university line. And if you go up, that's the most, the priciest parts of Toronto are along the young line. And, and, and immigrants, low-income immigrants or low-income households do not live in those areas. So where you have viable public transit, that's where Mr. To for, uh, Mr. Tory support lies, but that's also the high-income, expensive neighborhoods. When, you, when, you, when we have a situation where low-income households l are forced out to the periphery where transit is not a viable option, they would, move, they would use car regardless. So it wouldn't be a question of can they afford it or not. Car is their only alternative, and that's why they actually use car to drop their children to daycare or, or to schools and, and go to work and drive to work, which is, again, the destinations are also not transit-friendly locations. They may have to drive even further mm. to other municipalities or suburban municipalities where the same transit doesn't even provide service. Okay, I want to take a step back from Monday and talk about the campaign, the very lengthy campaign, 10 months, somewhere between, I don't know, 50 or 60 debates. How do um, debates affect which politicians people align with? 
I think debates do have effect. Be, not, it's not followed as, as, uh, as much as um, um, I would say people assume. There are too many debates. I mean, I, I can't believe that they have to debate every day or every other mm. day. Um, but they do shape people's opinion because then media next day reports on it. Uh, so you read about those debates in the newspapers. You see the coverage on television. So you see the issues being highlighted. I'm just surprised that how uni-focused that debate had been uh, where just it, it's a, uh, it just appeared to us that if we just put some track on ground, mm. that Toronto would be a better place. I, I still don't understand that. How did we miss such huge problems, income, income inequality in the city that is just so obvious now? From the, people have told us they have voted and told us that that matters a great deal. But Olivia Chow did put that on the radar during the campaign. I mean, she also talked a lot about transit and, and transportation, getting around the city. But she did talk a lot about to her housing. credit, she did bring up uh, social housing, and she was um, the I think the only candidate who brought it out as a as a as a strong piece in her. Um, in her platform. What, what surprises me and concerns me is that how did P the electorate miss that, where she was talking about their issues. And social housing is a concern. People have to wait seven to eight years to get to affordable housing in Toronto. And, and she was talking about it, but at somehow media didn't give that much attention and then the electorate didn't connect to it. And do you blame the media for that? Or, or I mean, where do you sort of put response? If, if, as you say, this is such a big issue in our city and you're hearing that people are talking about this, and yet, during the campaign, we heard, I mean, politicians, to an extent, do try to reflect what the electorate is talking about and debate those issues. And yet, it, 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 we didn't seem to have much I, of that. I, I don't think it's media. It's a collective fault. I don't think it's, it just falls on one entity or, or, or institution. Somehow, we've just focused on transportation. We thought that if we can find fast-moving trains, will be a better place. And, and the reality is that there are significant issues. People, visible minorities, are not seeing in uh, the same way the city, the way mayor or the communities that support the new mayor. So we have to see how we bridge these gaps and bridge these divides. Mm. I might also suggest that uh, when it comes to our immigrant population, especially, especially our recent one, that they're not tuning into the debates perhaps as much a, as a more established population because perhaps our English isn't as well established as other people. English language could yeah. be a barrier, but at the same time, if, you're, if you are primarily occupied with surviving, if you're primarily occupied with how do I'm going to pay this rent, you don't have the mm -hmm. time to sit down and listen to them. Or working two or three jobs. People are working two or three jobs, and they are really pressed for, for, for uh, survival. And then they don't have, I would say, the luxury to sit down and, and relax in front of the television and hear out all these debates. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you one more question uh, about immigrants and, and the immigration and how we saw Monday's vote uh, break down. If, um, you know, those who are economically successful voted for John Tory and, and those um, who, are, who are less so voted for the other candidates, does, what does this say? I mean, is there is this story about immigration or just about income? It's more of a question of income. I wouldn't see that as immigrant. If you look at the immigration, immigrant population, yes, there is a correlation. Neighborhoods that voted for Mr. Tory, um, uh, there, there were, they had much less immigrant population. But the real difference is on visible minorities, and the real difference is on income. Neighborhoods that predominantly voted for Mr. Tory had two times the income than those neighborhoods that voted for Mr. Ford. Neighborhoods that voted for Mr. Ford had two times the visible minorities than those who vis uh, voted for Mr. Tory. These are very very significant differences, and they do uh, concern me a lot. Okay, and why do they concern you? What, extrapolate here, what problems do, do you see on the horizon? You talked about, you know, potential ghettoization. You said, you know, they're not quite ghettos yet, but maybe. Well, you, if you look at other cities in Europe where we had riots, right, like England, London had riots. You look at Paris, they had riots. When you have these systematic inequalities, income inequalities, that they become so systematic and so difficult to break, then the society starts to to collapse, and then you see riots in the streets. We don't want that. We we still have time. We we I, I think Mr. Mr. Ford didn't Mr. Tory didn't create these problems. He is inheriting them, but he has the skills and the commitment um, to 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 fix this. And and if we, if there is a desire to build a more just and an equitable society in Toronto, these things could be done. And someone suggested it wasn't just Tory that's inherited that that, that this inheritance came from uh, amalgamation. Um, well. 
again, amalgamation didn't create these problems. These, these were existing before that, that the parts of the city were doing much better than... Um, um, so if you look at the, the work that has been done by David Hilchansky at the University of Toronto, he tracks incomes from 1970 to 2010. And again, amalgamation happened much later than 1970. These income disparities were there, and they were becoming worse over time. We just didn't pay attention okay, to it. Okay, but did amalgamation exacerbate the problem? I don't think so. I, I think amalgamation now provides us with an opportunity to see there's one city and it has different economic outcomes for the people. And before that, you could say, well, yeah, that's Scarborough's problem, that's Etobicoke's problem. Now it's Toronto's problem. And collectively, as an amalgamated city, we have much more resources than Scarborough would have or Etobicoke would have to address this. As a city together of 2.5 million people, 250 square miles, we have a much bigger chance of fixing this than leaving these um, former municipalities to their own resources, as was the case before amalgamation. Okay, if these problems date back pre-amalgamation, 1970s here was where the study sort of started looking at. We're talking about 40 years here. And you said John Tory has a mayor to be, John Tory has a tall order in front of him. Is it even possible to unite the city? Yes, it is. I mean, everything is possible. I, I think what what ha what needs okay, to okay. Let me say probable then. Yes, it is probable. Why not? I mean, look, if there is a will, if there is there is a desire to bring and embrace diversity, if he br if the new mayor puts in teams together that are not just talking about diversity, but are diverse by default. But you look at the team and you see all segments of the Toronto's composition are represented in the teams that he's putting together, and then they take real actions rather than cosmetic touch-ups here and there, then yes, people would see. People mm -hmm. actually, when they see progress, when they see actions, they believe in the political process. And, and some would argue that not only a, a team that looks diverse sort of ethnically and makeup, but also economically, that he has to bring people in from various points on the economic spectrum. Absolutely. I mean, just, just looking after races wouldn't be enough. You have to, if you are trying to raise the welfare or improve the welfare of the low-income households, it doesn't really matter if they are immigrants or otherwise. It doesn't really matter if they are colored or otherwise. It doesn't really matter. You have, we have a big problem even with our youth population. Our youth, our younger workers are not finding the employment that gives them w w decent wages. And it, it's not no longer a question of immigration. It's a question of the fact that our economy is not producing jobs that are required and, and for, for the younger cohorts. So the mayor has to have a diverse group of people around him so to get the, um, the, the advice he really needs. I feel very sorry for the last four years that we have wasted. None of this was a debate. We, we as a city collectively did not debate it, did not worry about it, but now is a good time, now is a good mayor, now is a good opportunity. We can fix this if we can take the right steps and, and, and be committed about it. Except, again, some might say since John Tory did so well in the areas um, that aren't low income, that aren't uh, high immigration, that he may not have a, I don't know, political motive, motivation to, I, I, know, I know he has said, yes, we're going to unite the city and I'm going to do that. And I'm, and I'm not second guessing that we're in very, very early days. But if you look at how how those numbers break down, his vote didn't come from there. Well, well if I look at the numbers now and I see the trends, um, then I can say if there's nothing done, then this would be a one-term mayor because those cohorts who did not vote for Mr. Tory are expanding. Demographically speaking, the number of people who are not doing well in, uh, are, are increasing. And when it comes to voting, it's one person, one vote. So if we do not address this, and if there is no uh, splitting of votes in the next mayoral elections, then the cohort that represents, or the, the candidate that represents the low-income um, visible minorities, younger cohorts, is more likely to take over and win the elections. So it is for his political um, uh, longevity that the mayor should pay mm. attention. You're already thinking four years out, aren't you? I always think four years <laughs> out. <laughs> Thank you very much for breaking this all down for us. Thank you for coming in. Thank you kindly. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.